people online and we've had to create a new uh, Teams room. Careful of the wires, please. Um, and um, uh, I'm hoping everyone's migrated from the old Teams to new Teams links. Uh, such is life these days. So welcome to this year's Fiction Hub Lectures. Um, as you probably know, this lectures uh, in the life of uh, Sir Edward Evan Pritchard, who was a fellow of this college for uh, 24 years, and he's had very wide interests. He was a social anthropologist, but he was also interested in classical studies, modern history, oriental studies. So these lectures, and he was not just an Africanist, he also was interested in the Middle East and the Mediterranean. So these lectures cover all of those areas, all of, the, all of those disciplines, um, on no fixed rotation, we just and the, the idea of these lectures is to is that they should lecture should be someone you know, other things being equal, and, and it, should, it should be someone it's an early career uh, researcher rather than a well established person, and and um, we just you know we advertise and we take the best person. So one could hardly imagine someone who fitted that rubric better than today's lecturer Mark Fatih Masood. He's a lawyer among the anthropologists and religious studies scholars. He's a political scientist when he's among the lawyers, and he's, a, uh, and above, he's all of the above when, when he does ethnographic fieldwork in Sudan and Somalia. He's professor of politics and legal studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and he's combining his Evans Richard lecturership here with visiting lecture professorship at the Faculty of Law. He's had uh, many prestigious fellowships from all the top US foundations. He's a leading expert on Islamic law. His first book, Law's Fragile State, Colonial, Authoritarian and Humanitarian Legacies in Sudan, was published by CUP in 2013 in the um, well-known series Cambridge Studies in Law and Society. And the kind of reviews that it received you know, contained you know, words like groundbreaking, remarkable scholarship, meticulous, thought-provoking, or at least the terms that jump out, uh, and it won the 2014 Herbert Jacob Award. His second book, Sharia Inshallah, Finding God in Somali Legal Politics, was published in that same series in 2021, and it received similar levels of praise, and it upends most of what most people think they know about Islamic law. So I think these lectures are going to cover a lot of that same ground, but also push on and uh, um, uh, the general title is a, a legal politics of religion building in Islamic rule of law in the Horn of Africa. So this is the first lecture, which we very much look forward to, uh, and um, there'll be time for questions afterwards. Yours, yours. Thanks everyone for being here. Good afternoon. Uh, I am grateful to, can, can folks hear me okay in the back? And I hope people online can hear me as well. I'm just gonna, Hope that everyone is is uh, is with us now. Um, thanks for your patience as we got everything sorted. And please, uh, if you are in the room, be mindful, of course, of the microphones here. Um, we wanted to make it as dangerous as possible <laughs> to be in this room, um, so we laid out the, the microphones right in the middle of the walking path. So please, it's very easy to trip. So please be careful as you enter and exit from the aisles. It's really good to see everyone here. Um, I'm especially grateful to All Souls College for inviting me uh, to deliver these lectures this, uh, this year, um, especially to Professor David Gellner uh, for organizing uh, the details of the visit and others at All Souls. Um, to my colleagues, I'm a visiting professor in the Faculty of Law in the Center for Sociolegal Studies. Uh, to my colleagues there, um, welcome. I'm also grateful uh, for, as, as someone who does field work, I'm grateful for the kindness, and I want to start with that that gratitude for the kindness of the people whom I met in my research in Sudan, in South Sudan, in Somalia, and in Somaliland. And one of those people I met, uh, we'll call her Salma. And Salma, um, I met her outside of Khartoum, which is Sudan's capital city. Um, and she lived in an encampment for people who were displaced uh, by the civil war. Um, at the time, Sudan had the world's largest population of internally displaced persons. More than 2 million people uh, were displaced uh, by the civil war in Sudan. They weren't considered refugees because they hadn't crossed an international border, so they were considered internally displaced persons. Um, this was Africa's longest civil war, um, and she lived in an encampment much like uh, the one you see from this photo from the British Guardian newspaper. Um, and Salma was young, 
um, by many of our standards. She was in her 30s, and she invited me into the small uh, roofless shack uh, that was her home um, so that I could ask her about human rights, so that I could ask her about human rights. Now, you might be wondering, why did I go to this place to ask this woman about human rights? Well, Selma had been a participant in something called a legal awareness workshop, a legal awareness workshop. And it was organized, these workshops were being organized all over Sudan, and indeed they were organized all over the world by international aid workers. Actually, actually what it is is um, United Nations agencies and international NGOs giving funding and support to local non-governmental organizations, local civic groups, to train people about their human rights. So the point of these workshops is to educate survivors of war about the law, to educate them specifically about their human rights, uh, about international treaties like the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the CEDAW Treaty. And I wanted to know what Salma learned from these workshops. What, if anything, she learned or what came of these workshops. I was intrigued about the whole point of these workshops in these spaces. Um, and, and Selma welcomed me inside. Um, she offered me tea and biscuits when she had very little for herself. Um, and when she sat down, <laughs> she said, you know, this country has rights. Sudan has rights. But they never give rights to us. They never give rights to us as people. The country itself has rights, the people do not. And her statement struck me because just like the workshops tried to teach Salma that she could believe in the power of rights, she could believe in the power of law, I too was trained to believe in the power of rights, to believe in the power of law uh, in law school as, as a lawyer. I was trained to believe that the purpose of human rights, or the purposes of government rather, is to safeguard human rights. That's the whole point of having governments uh, to safeguard, or one of the main points of having governments, to safeguard our human rights. I cannot presume to comprehend the horrors of people's daily experiences in these places, but Salma's experience was of a government that had defined itself by a particularly narrow view of Islam and of Sharia. Sharia is very roughly translated as Islamic law. I could give a whole lecture, and probably some of you could give a whole lecture on the relationship between calling something Sharia or Islamic law. But I think for our purposes right now, let's just hold that in a footnote. This government defined itself by a very narrow view of Islam um, and Sharia, in which the police could uh, imprison Salma for brewing and selling alcohol in order to make a living uh, in the IDP camp where she lived in which the government hospital could deny Salma's mother medical treatment for the broken leg that she had at the time I was interviewing Salma, in which the local school could deny Salma's daughter the right to a free education. And Salma explained to me, I am a citizen of Sudan, but I never get my rights. Now, my lectures over the next few weeks will show you how governments have taken rights from people and how they use religion to do it, and how activists have also tried to take rights back, and how they too use religion to do it. I've learned that these fights over rights reveal that the law itself is very much like a religious faith with its own internally coherent theology and that we should interpret the law like a religion. Similar to a God, the law demands our faith in it, the law demands that we surrender to it, and the law demands that we desire it, similar to a God. Both law and religious faith the slide on the right-hand side of the screen, both law and religious faith are used instrumentally as tools. They're ideal, certainly, and I think lots of legal philosophers would say, hey, wait a second, law and religion or, or, or theologians, these are ideals, these are values. 
But when I see them through the lens of historical research, when I see them through the lens of fieldwork, of interviews like the one I did with Salma, I see how people use law and religion instrumentally as tools of politics. This relationship between law and religion that Salma experienced so viscerally in her life emerged in part out of colonial rule. When uh, British administrators uh, trained people, tried to convince people to see law as a source of rights and a source of salvation, very much like the legal workshops I talked about in the contemporary times. Okay, let's back up for a moment. Let's back up for a moment. I want us to think about who these lectures are named after. Sir Evans Pritchard. Uh, he was professor of social anthropology here at the University of Oxford. He worked in and studied colonized spaces. These spaces that I have studied bore names like the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan and British Somaliland. Many of the young colonial administrators in these spaces um, had studied at the colleges that make up this very University of Oxford, if not most of them. And their colonial rule also shaped my own background as someone from Sudan. E.P., as he came to be known, or Evans Pritchard, he studied history here at Oxford at Exeter College. Uh, he was not a colonial administrator, uh, but he collaborated with um, and benefited from colonial networks. He was also, and here I quote the words of his former student, uh, the professor Wendy James. Uh, he was also a frustrated radical on the top of the screen, a frustrated radical. I love this term to describe Evans Pritchard. As much as he benefited from colonial networks, as much as he benefited from colonial funding for his research, his goal was something a little different. He tried to show the world that the Arab and African persons, the Arab and African persons whom he met were not the uncivilized or quote unquote primitive humans that other scholars had made them out to be for so long. So Evans Pritchard, EP, was a little different because he used colonial rule, he used colonial funding to help Western scholars, his contemporaries and those he drew from in his research, to help them see the shared humanity in different peoples. And it is in this spirit of shared humanity that I give these lectures. As the Prophet Muhammad said publicly in now what is maybe the oldest surviving statement of anti-racism, there is no superiority of an Arab over a non-Arab or a non-Arab over an Arab, and no superiority of a white person over a black person or a black person over a white person, except the Prophet Muhammad said in their piety. With that in mind, let me give you an overview of my lectures. They are collectively titled A Legal Politics of Religion, and the four lectures find parallels across the very unstable categories of law and religion. There are probably a number of anthropologists in this room who are saying, we need to define law, we need to define religion. Let's just footnote it for a moment. Let's because I know there are huge debates amongst legal philosophers how to define law. Many of them worked at this university, Dworkin, Hart, others. There are debates over how to define religion. Let's bracket those. I'm happy to talk about them in, in the Q&A. But think about what you know of law and religion as I talk about these categories, these unstable categories of law and religion, and also politics, because I see them deeply as forms of politics. So the four lectures find parallels between these categories of law and religion. Most importantly, how both the law and religious faith demand our submission to a higher power and our desire for a higher power. Remember those three things I mentioned earlier, faith, submission, and desire. And the law and religious faith both demand all three of these things from us, all three of these things from us. Law and religion are categories of the human. They are mediated by the human. And I think strikingly, they also take us beyond the human. Today's lecture, May 10th, A Legal Politics of Religion, sets out this kind of theoretical architecture or theoretical frame of this theology of the law, theology of the rule of law. 
Next Tuesday, May 17th, the lecture Faith in the Rule of Law in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. I'll show you how colonial administrators, dictators, authoritarian regimes, political scientists call them, and aid workers or humanitarian activists or human rights um, lawyers, how they've all tried to build a similar kind of faith, faith in legal systems. Now, these are very different kinds of people, dictators, colonial administrators, human rights activists, very different kinds of people. But they all share in common this desire to build our faith in the law, our faith in legal systems, in the power of the law, in the power of the state. The paradox of building more faith in law is that it demands people have less faith in religion. And so that's next Tuesday, May 17th. Swinging over to the top right hand side of the screen, two Tuesdays from now on May 24th, God willing, I will show how some people reclaim religion, how they take rights back. So that's on May 24th, using Sharia principles to do things like fight colonialism, topple dictatorships, campaign for gender equality, using Islamic principles. Now we would expect, or I would expect as a lawyer, the rule of law, this idea, this value of limiting arbitrary power, the rule of law. I would expect the rule of law to be doing that kind of work. But this lecture on May 24th will show you how people use Sharia as a form of legal politics. In the final lecture, May 31st, on the bottom right-hand side of the screen, the final lecture on May 31st will be a little different. It'll be a little different. I'm going to give attention to how our self-identifications, our marginalizations, gender, race, ethnicity, class, national origin, all of these things that make up our identities, how these things shape the research that we do as students and as scholars. These were um, central themes um, in Evans Pritchard's life, whether he wrote about them um, or not. But what I, try to, what I try to do is unite these themes of law, politics, religion, identity. So I look forward to our discussions this month, starting today, um, as, as I try and make these connections between these four themes. Um, so one lecture, sort of more theoretical, May 10th. Um, uh, another lecture sh showing how people, governments, excuse me, how governments are taking rights. May 24th, uh, May 7th, that's May 17th. May 24th, how people are taking those rights back. And then May 31st on methods and positionality, on positionality and identity. Okay, so now that you have a sense of the overview of the lectures, and my objective of the four lectures. Let me jump into today's themes. So bear with me. This is this is also I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this is also a little different for me because I'll be giving kind of a more theoretical sweep as someone who's very data driven. Um, it's it, it feels different for me to do this. So bear with me. I'm going to be talking about theological principles like consubstantiality and other things that I don't know very much about. I'll, I'll be honest. So so. We'll talk during the Q&A. All right. Um, what I want to leave you with, what I want to leave you with in the lectures is this parallel between the legal and the theological. So keep that in mind as I talk, this parallel between the legal and the theological. And to do that, I'm going to do three things. The three things on the screen. First, I'm going to draw on the field of theology to describe how the law has its roots in theology. The law itself has theological roots. Second, I will argue that law and theology demand three things from us, faith, surrender, and desire. I've already mentioned them. And third and finally, I'll show you that the law has abandoned its religious and theological foundations, tearing apart the theological from the legal and replacing one higher power in God with another higher power in law. Now, here's why these three po points are important. Here's why I'm doing this in today's lecture. I'm doing this because they form the foundation, as I said, of lectures to come, but I'm also doing this because they form the foundation of faith in God and faith in law. 
For many religious persons, God is an unqualified good for which there is nothing greater. And likewise, for many people who have faith in law or the rule of law, law, legal systems, constitutions are the unqualified good for which there is nothing greater. And we continue to build our societies, our legal systems, our nation states on this kind of fraught relationship between these two competing higher powers, God and the state, God and the law. Okay, so I've mentioned theology. What is theology and how is the law like a theology? I would define theology, this is not in the slide, but I wanna say it. I would define theology as an understanding of a pre-existing faith in a higher power. And that phrase pre-existing is really important. I'm gonna talk about that in a moment, but I want you to hold on to that. An understanding of a pre-existing faith in a higher power. The uh, American Jesuit theologian, his name is Roger Haight, the Jesuit theologian, Catholic. Um, he defines theological studies as a discipline that interprets all of reality, human existence, society, history, the world, and God in terms of the symbols of religious faith. Now notice how all of these things exist simultaneously. They pre-exist, they're pre-existing simultaneously, uh, unquestionably. Uh, so they're all sort of together, humanity, history, society, the world, God. This is important, I think, because what separates theology from other social sciences is that other social sciences erase this. Other social sciences erase God. There's a presumption of the existence of humanity, society, history, and the world, but not a presumption of a pre-existing God. Okay, so I've defined theology for you or, or, and, and the discipline of theology as I understand it through Roger Haight, because I think an understanding of the, of the theological, of what it means for something to be theological, is important in order to argue that the law is theological. And what I mean is that a pre-existing idea of a God, maybe a small g God, the presence of some kind of higher power is at work uh, in is at work in the law, just as the presence of a higher power is at work in theology. This higher power is unquestionably present to the religious faithful in the same way that human existence, society, history, and the world are unquestionably present to all of us here in this room. No one would deny the existence of humanity or society or the world uh, or history in this room. And similarly for the faithful, they would deny the existence of God either. Let me explain a little more about how the law is theological. Um, by sharing the field of theological anthropology. Now, the field of theological anthropology is not a subfield in the discipline of anthropology. Quite the contrary. It's a subfield in the discipline of theology. And theologians created this field precisely because anthropologists, they, they witnessed anthropologists reject this, reject this kind of pre-existing <laughs> of, of God. Um, so it's not the same as talking about, for those of you who are anthropologists, it's not the same as talking about the anthropology of religion or secularism. Theological anthropology is, is a different kind of field. And it's really about creating or using ethnographic methods to raise theological questions. Theological questions, not about the existence of God, that's not a theological question, but about what God's pre-existing existence what God's pre-existing existence actually does. That is a theological question. What does God's existence do in society? And I think Evans Pritchard cared about some of these questions, maybe in a way that the theological anthropologists do as well. Likewise, I argue on the right side of the screen, as many legal anthropologists, I think, would, that to understand the law, we cannot question the law's existence. We don't question the law's 
existence. We know it exists. We know it exists. It's what the law's existence does that matters. It's not what the law says. It is what the law does. Let me give you an example. We are just kind of an everyday example. We are born into societies that already have legal systems, rules, constitutions, regulations. These are prenatal for, or, for all of us. Um, an entire ecosystem of faith in the law surrounds us. Um, it, it's taken place across generations, and we are born into societies that have this pre-existing faith in, uh, in that legal ecosystem. Uh, the legal arrangements uh, are so ever-present in our societies that we can miss that the very thing that is in front of us, and here I'm looking at the exit sign in the very back of the room, the very thing that is in front of us has its sources in the law, like the traffic light outside the college telling us when and where we can stop, or the particular size and shape and color of our emergency exit signs. So theological anthropology calls upon humans to uncover the mysteries of faith in God. And I draw on theological anthropology because so too does the law call upon us as legal scholars, as anthropologists, to uncover the mysteries of faith in law and our faith uh, in law's claims to power over our lives. Another way of finding the law's theological roots and the ways that law constructs our societies is through the legal principle of, con excuse me, the theological principle of consubstantiality, consubstantiality. Okay, when two things are consubstantial, they are different in form, but in essence, they are the same. In Christianity, uh, Jesus Christ is consubstantial with what Christians call God the Father. Jesus Christ is consubstantial with God the Father. These are two different forms of God, but the same essence. Two different forms of God, but the same essence. That's consubstantiality. And I argue that law and society are also consubstantial. Two different forms of the same broader essence, which is a higher power. Consubstantiality has two organizing principles. Um, this is, here I'm drawing from the work of the American feminist theologian Sandra Schneiders. And the two principles of consubstantiality is there's some kind of foundational relational experience, some kind of foundational experience that we all relate to in that particular society. And that foundational experience has a content that is transmitted across generations. It is a lived tradition. It is a lived tradition. Uh, the foundational experience in uh, the Abrahamic faiths is faith in God's supremacy, that no one is above God. I think likewise, we could argue that in our modern societies, in our modern societies, we could say that the consubstantiality principle um, is that the law is supreme, that no one is above the law. That is a sort of foundational relational experience that is prenatal to all of us, that we are all born into, that is then transmitted across generations that it's almost ingrained in our minds and we don't realize it's there. Um, but it is the foundation of our faith in this higher power, our faith in law and society. Uh, the Abrahamic faiths transmit these foundational events and symbols across generations. Uh, Jews reading uh, the Exodus account from the Torah or Haggadah, each Passover. Christians praying the Nicene Creed uh, at Catholic worship services, at Catholic Mass. Muslims memorizing the Quran uh, and attending Friday khutbahs or sermons. I want you to see that much like these faiths have foundational experiences, the reception of the Ten Commandments, uh, Muhammad's life, the creation of the Nicene Creed in the third century. Much like these um, religious faiths have their own foundational experiences that are transmitted across generations and centuries, so too are law and society consubstantial. In law and society, our foundational relational experience with the law, where does it come from? I would say it comes from our ongoing lives in societies whose laws are passed down and whose constitutions are passed down in and through us. And you see this happening in real time 
in the United States right now, as the U.S. Supreme Court reinterprets the foundational experience of, this, of the Constitution of the United States to reconsider uh, a con the constitutional right of a woman's uh, reproductive health capacity. You see this reinterpretation of fundamental laws happening as the British Parliament debates whether to deem animals as non-human persons worthy of rights. Okay, so I've shown, I've shown you um, different ways, different ways of seeing the law as a kind of theology. Um, we can presume law's existence in the same way that uh, theologians presume God's existence. And we also continually interpret foundational principles like constitutions or foundational principles like what is a human in the law and can or what is a person in the law? Can animals be seen as persons? We continually reinterpret these foundational principles of constitutional rights or what it means to be a person um, in our societies. Um, and this is similar to the consubstantiality principle in theology. As we continually reinterpret these things, law and society, we see law and society as becoming two kind of bodies of the same essence. Uh, in his lectures that were later published as the book, Theories of Primitive Religion, Ed, uh, Evans Pritchard said that doing field research on topics related to religion, quote, demands a poetic mind that moves easily in images and symbols. If you've been with me so far, you probably have a poetic mind that moves easily in images and symbols, just like E.P. did. And I think the same can be said of doing field work on law. Like religion, law is an innovation that we humans interpret and use to form our societies. Okay, let me now turn to the second parallel between the legal and the theological. And that is these three things um, that are consistent or that unify law and theology, faith, surrender, and desire. And faith, surrender, and desire are really the they're really the psychological foundation animating uh, many religions, and I argue animating our legal systems. So let me start with, let me start with faith. So I'll take, um, this, you'll, this slide will be up for a while, and I'll start with faith, and then I'll get into this surrender and desire. So let me start with faith. Faith is a fundamental human understanding that there is a power that exists outside of us that there is a, a power that exists outside of us, maybe even outside of humanity. Uh, in Vatican I, Catholic theologians defined the uh, quote-unquote ultimate of faith as an understanding of the ultimate authority of God. How do we understand the ultimate authority of God? And I think the ultimate goal of law is understanding the ultimate authority of law, where that authority even comes from. And I think it comes from faith. I think it comes from faith that a higher power that we have named law is out there and it's stronger than everyone and everything. No one is above it. Let me give you an example from an aid worker I met. Let me give you an example. Um, she was an American, she was an American trained international lawyer uh, who designed and drafted a constitution for, for the Somali people in Somalia. Um, you might be asking, why was an American in Somalia drafting a constitution? The Somalis never asked her to do it. Uh, the Somalis never approached her and said, hey, can you draft a constitution for us? The United Nations asked her to do it uh, and, to, and to bring a team together to do it. Um, so you're probably wondering, why did the United Nations ask her to do it if the Somalis did not ask her to do this for them? And I asked her this question. And she told me that she thought the United Nations wanted to show the world that Somalia could enshrine a Bill of Rights and enshrine the rule of law so that people could believe in something, so that people could believe in something. But she herself didn't believe in it because, as she told me, the process was so flawed. And the Somali people and the ones who were involved in the drafting of this constitution, even though they were involved in the process, they also didn't believe in it, she told me, 
unsurprisingly, because they never really wanted it in the first place. And at the end of my interview with this international lawyer, she asked rhetorically, and this is not on the screen, but I'll tell you the quote. She said, quote, what good is a legal system if it was designed to tick off a box on some United Nations strategic framework document? And I've asked myself that very same question. What good is a legal system if it's designed you know, by outsiders? And I think that the answer is that the legal form itself, the actual paper, the document, the constitution, once it exists, the very existence of that form is meant to create belief in it. The very existence in it creates its belief. If Somalis have a new constitution that enshrines the rule of law, maybe state officials will then believe in it. That was the point of this project. Now, of course, that is not always the case. That is not always true. But I, what I want you to see is that constitutions and laws are visible. They are visible manifestations of people's faith, of our faith in a higher power. Okay, so that's faith. That's faith. What I want you to see here when I describe faith is that faith is fundamental. Without faith, theology can't work. Without faith, law, legal systems, constitutions can't work either. The second essential element that makes something legal or theological is surrender. So once I believe, once I believe, once I have faith in a higher power, God, the constitution, the rule of law, whatever the higher power is, the next step in any legal or theological order is for me to submit to its authority. I have to give it authority as my agency. And the moment I surrender, that very moment, that very moment that I surrender my power, that very moment that I submit, is the moment that I make that thing more powerful than I am. If I surrender myself to God, if I surrender, my, surrender myself to the police, if I surrender myself uh, to what I believe the rules of a constitution require, or what I believe the rules of my culture require, or the rules of my faith require, all of this is surrendering. This surrender, what I want you to see is this surrender does not sap us of our agency. It does not take away our, ag our agency. It is our agency. It is our agency. Uh, this agency that comes from sur surrender is, I would argue, the, the defining feature of democratic legal systems, our surrender to our legal systems. It is the animating principle that we are all agents of the law, but that no one person is above the law. We are all agents of the law, but none of us are above the law. Indeed, this submission to higher power is the first commandment of the rule of law faith. But there is no God other than the law. There is no God other than the law, and there is no human or God above the law. Surrender is when I submit myself, my will, to the pre-existing will of some kind of higher power. In Arabic, there is a word for this. There is a word for this that connotes surrender. Some of you may be familiar with this word. Many of you may know the word. And that is when people say the word inshallah. Inshallah. Often thrown at the end of a sentence. If you have any friends who speak Arabic, it's just thrown at the end of a sentence. But really the deep meaning, the Quranic meaning of inshallah has to do with surrender by the will of God. It connotes a kind of surrendering to the will of God. And so when you hear people speaking Arabic and they use this phrase, it is a consistent reminder of a higher power, consistently, inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. Surrendering is not something that we produce as much as it is something in which we participate. Whether it's saying inshallah, whether it's surrendering to constitutions, um, etc. Now, let me extend this to human rights law. Let me extend this to human rights law. In human rights law, my humanity is defined by my submission or my surrender to the authority of law. Human rights does not work unless state officials surrender themselves to it. It simply does not work. The authority of the state is not in any person, but rather beyond humanity. Human rights sort of exist beyond humanity. 
To return to the example I mentioned of the international aid worker in the Somalia constitution, uh, United Nations aid workers whom I told you uh, drafted the constitution for Somalia, they did so with the express purpose, the express purpose that once that constitution exists, government officials and people alike will surrender themselves to it. The very existence of it will just enable a surrender. Why? Because that's our faith. That's our faith. Okay, to summarize, surrender, both law and faith rely on the operative concept of surrendering to non-human entities, things like gods or constitutions that we believe can and should set limits on human behavior. But faith and surrender are not enough to make a theology. And faith and surrender are also not enough to make law. So that brings me to the third element uniting the legal and the theological, and that is desire. A desire for a higher power. Here I'm not discussing desire for power. Certainly there are people in the world, and I'll talk about that in next week's lecture, who desire power. I'm talking about <laughs> desire for higher power. Very different form of desire, which actually animates the fundamental principle of the rule of law, that there is no arbitrary power. These are what I would call counter hegemonic desires. Many people use this term. I don't know why I said what I would call, but many people call them counter hegemonic desires. Human rights are counter hegemonic desires because we want everyone to submit to the authority of human rights. Desire compels our submission to God. It compels our submission to law. And when I desire submission, when I surrender to that desire, it is in that surrendering, it is in that desire that I create my agency and my identity. This is not new that Michel Foucault write, wrote about this um, in his work uh, on sexuality. Centuries of human history across many places of humans submitting themselves to what they understand to be God's will, of humans desiring to do the will of God. I think that alone provides enough evidence for the existence of desire of human desire for higher power, of human desire for submitting to higher power. Otherwise they die. Otherwise they die. Legal principles, theological principles, um, they die when no one desires them anymore, uh, when no one cares to interpret them anymore. They become historical artifacts. Okay, so I've discussed uh, faith, surrender, desire as three key elements of the legal and the theological. Well, let me spend uh, the last maybe five or seven minutes or so turning to the third and final thing I wanted to discuss um, to remind you why I took us on this theological journey tonight, why I seek to reunite the legal with the theological. I do this because our societies have spent the last three or four centuries tearing them apart. This is what anthropologists call the secular process, the separation and active management of religious faith in our politics and our, in our societies. Replacing faith in God with faith in law was central to the development of early modern European imaginations. It was central to the Enlightenment. Uh, during the Enlightenment of the 17th through 19th centuries, European monarchies and state governments uh, decoupled themselves from the authority of churches. And then when they separated uh, church from state, either in name or in practice, the law seemed to abandon its religious roots and its religious traditions. By design in Enlightenment Europe, the law was kept at a distance. The law was kept at arm's length away uh, from religious leaders. Religion would then slowly become a worldview that competed directly with political liberalism and its values of the rule of law, even a threat to the rule of law, as my next few lectures will show religion as a threat to the rule of law. 
for all the ideals that it produced, the Enlightenment for all of its ideals and values, it also unmoored, it unmoored in our lives the law rhetorically from its religious foundation. This government uh, taking of religious faith and then taking faith and then separating it from the state, this, this secularizing process. It made its way into colonial administrations after the Enlightenment. And my research, parts of which I will share in the next lecture, shows how colonial law was designed with the express purpose of building the rule of law while also subsuming the power of religion in, in, into the state. Colonialism helped to build structures for the rule of law while controlling religious structures. And so I return in today's lecture to the precarious place where I started with colonialism. And I return to Evans Pritchard's own precarious relationship with colonialism. The state itself desired religion, not submitting to it, but controlling it. In the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan and British Somaliland, colonial administrators demanded their Arab and African subjects to see the states and its laws as central elements of social structure. Ripping Islam away from the Somalis and the Sudanese, but also managing Islam, creating different forms of Islam, as my next lectures will show. And all of this was happening while Evans Pritchard was doing his research. He saw this happen in real time. I don't know, and I'll never know how it impacted him while he was studying religion and magic and law, but I know he was raised by a clergyman and he would later convert to Catholicism shortly before joining this All Souls College, 1940s. And he bore witness to this colonial taking of religion and religious faith. And maybe he challenged it in his own way through his work. And I challenge, likewise, this separation of religion and law that forms the foundation of our societies. Let me summarize by saying that the rule of law, whether the rule of law is promoted by colonial administrators, whether the rule of law is promoted by post-colonial governments, dictatorships, or democracies, whether the rule of law is promoted by international aid workers, like that lawyer I mentioned who drafted Somalia's constitution, um, whether the rule of law is promoted by women's rights activists, who we'll talk about in my third lecture. The rule of law offers itself to us as an alternative theology. So when someone like Salma, who I mentioned at the start of the talk, the survivor of war, when she attends a legal awareness workshop, a paradox, a paradox is taking place. She's being trained to believe. She's being trained to have faith in rights as a step towards fighting for those rights in the very court systems the governments have set up to take rights away, all in the name of the rule of law. She is being asked to embrace a faith in human rights, maybe even sidelining her own religious faith, she is being secularized. <laughs> and like a theology, the rule of law offers its own systematically developed and internally coherent theory of a higher power, its own theology. We must have faith in that power. We must surrender to that power. We must desire that power for our societies to operate. Faith, surrender, desire. These concepts that unite, that consubstantiate our law and society. My next lecture on Tuesday will demonstrate this argument using historical and ethnographic detail. I will show how the process of constructing our nations, the very process of state building, can separate law and religion in theory. But in culture and politics, these concepts remain very much entwined. So thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions and comments about this legal politics of religion and theology of the rule of law.